Thank you for joining us here at Covenant Moravian Church for another series in Lighting Your Way. Today we have one of our discipleship sessions. The Reverend Wayne Biggs will be sharing with us on retaining and recruiting members. Do find this discipleship session very informative as you share with us today worship with a difference. seek Lord it is your wisdom that we crave after even more it is you that we want and in our understanding of you and how you seek to operate in our lives will make us into better instruments so in the words of that songwriter, we say, Lord, we are available to you. We are available, some entirely empty, and desire to be filled up with you and by you, and some halfway there, and desire to be filled to the very brim. And others are so engaged and desire to have an overflow. So whatever stage we are in our lives this morning, we admit that we need more of you and that we are available for you to use us as you see fit. So bless our time together. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. A question was put to me some years ago, and I find it very, very interesting. It was my mother who actually posed the question to me. Sarita's mom is my second mother, and she's oftentimes taken as my biological mom. So when I say my mother, you may assume that it is mom. <laughs> All right? But my biological mom. She said to me, when? What do you call a pastor who serves a congregation in Germany? I said, I don't know. She said, think about it a little longer. I said, oh, a German shepherd. And then she said, well, it's you who said it, huh? <laughs> Not me. You know, as we talk about recruiting and retaining 
members. As I got the theme and I looked at it, and I began my preparations, I felt more pulled to the ending of that theme that has more to do with retaining as opposed to recruiting. And in my reading and in my research, in my reasoning with the Lord in my spirit, there are three particular terminologies that are used throughout scripture that I have come to have almost uh, a struggle with, trying to understand which one is really the one to give full focus and attention to. I speak of these three terms, the first as being the kingdom concept. What it means to be members of the kingdom of God. A kingdom does not have members. A kingdom has citizens. A kingdom does not deal with grace. A kingdom deals with law and justice. So it's not about trying to appease someone to do something for you, but to act within the rights of the laws that you have as a citizen. So I struggle with embracing the full concept of the kingdom and being a kingdom citizen and then the other two concepts that we sometimes have conversation around within our churches. The second is membership. The church talks a lot about members and just like the concept of kingdom, we have in the New Testament, Paul and other writers using the terminology of the body of Christ and that we are members of that body. And so we have become more familiar and accustomed to the terminology of members. So we treat with the church as a family of members. The third concept that I struggle with coming out of scripture is a concept of being a sheep. From the Old Testament into the New Testament, we find the presentation by so many writers referring to God's people as a flock, that we are members of a fold, that we are sheep. And that kind of terminology leads us to talk a lot in our church circles about us being sheep a part of the very flock of God. Now, if you are a citizen, then you are one with particular rights. If you are members, then you are one with particular right within the family as well. And if you are a sheep, then you are 
a member of that forum. Perhaps all three concepts has their respective place and places within the life of the church. But there is, in my opinion, a grave danger when we attempt to don't play the principles of the kingdom that we are citizens over members and flock. So I, I struggle with this particular concept and still continue to struggle and hope to find an answer at some given point. Maybe you have the answer. I do not assume that I am speaking to individuals who are lacking in providing solutions and answers. It is a conversation. And I'm not coming with all the answers or the answer, but perhaps an answer. My brothers and sisters, if we refer to the body of Christ as members or citizens or sheep, whatever terminology we use, we must bear this in mind. Every single one of us are important and valuable. Every one of us must feel accepted, must feel appreciated, and must feel a sense of belong. When we consider church growth and retaining of church membership, we must deal with three specific realities. We must deal with reality number one, the cause. We must deal with reality number two, the concern. And we must deal with reality number three, correct measures. Meeting the needs of people within our churches will determine whether people stay with us or not for how long. It is addressing the real needs of people that will determine whether or not people stay with us and for how long they are willing to stay. When we understand this, my brothers and sisters, that people will not always stay but we must provide every kind of comforting reasons that will help them to stay and to be productive within the body of Christ and the context of our churches. But this is what I believe we sometimes get comfortable with. We get a little bit too comfortable with this understanding that people come and people go. We must understand this, but we should never use it for comfort. I won't forget an experience of sitting in a meeting 
talking about recruiting and retaining members within our church. And that was almost 19 years ago. And the elder in that meeting said, well, brethren, let me tell you, I believe that they went out from us because they weren't a part of us. Had they been a part of us, they would still be here with us. So the ones that we have lost, they weren't really meant to be a part of us. And I don't want us to lose anymore. So, so we are comfortable with, with this. And I thought to myself, what is he saying? We take a sense of comfort in that portion of scripture that they weren't meant to be a part of us. So let them leave without even understanding why they're leaving. You see, my brothers and sisters, even Jesus had to deal with loss. He had 70 disciples. He said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood in a conversation, and then that number came down to 12. He said to the 12, will you also go? And they said, to whom shall we go? You have the word of truth. In the end, in the garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, he said, Father, I have lost one out of the twelve. Only one. And in his word, it was destined to be so. Every church will have losses. People move away or people graduate to heaven. And it's inevitable that some people will leave the church despite its best efforts to help them feel belong. Sometimes God wants to replant people elsewhere. Sometimes it's a matter of best fit. I was the assistant pastor for a church. My mother became a member of that church. She was very zealous for God, got baptized, and uh, was involved. She came to see me one day in the office and she said, I'm, I'm not comfortable here. I said, what can we do to make you more comfortable? She said, the style of worship. I'm just not comfortable here. I said, where would you be more comfortable? And she pointed out. I said, well, mom, if that place makes you feel more comfortable and you feel that we're not fulfilling your spiritual need, then I suggest to you, go there. If that will make you grow and be a better Christian. Well, she left. I'm not certain if it was because of my advice. But she went there. She was now a member of that church for about three years, all fired up and excited. At the end of the third year, she called me. My son, I want to talk to you. Yes, mom. Boy, I'm just not comfortable where I'm at. Um, what do you mean? I thought that where you are, you're growing more spiritually and you're better. She said, yeah, but I'm just not, just not my style. It's cramping me. Mom, I don't really understand. Explain a little further. Well, I tell you what, there is, and she began to explain. And for the last 17 going 18 years, she has been a member of a particular church. And for her, that is now home and home for good. 
So, so I get that to mean that it's best fit. You follow? Best fit for her. And so now she is at a place where she is a lot more engaged and where she is a lot more expressive. And she feels comfortable there. And that is why I believe God allows various denominations, you know, because he has a wide variety of people. Now, even though you realize that the people come and people go, you want to have many more coming and more staying and few going, <laughs> if at all possible. Let me ask you, is your church intentional in its efforts to retain the people who have come through your doors? I read an article some years ago that says if we were to tabulate the amount of persons that exit our churches, it would far outnumber the ones that are coming in. It's almost like we have eh, the tunnel or funnel turn in the opposite direction, where you have the smaller entry and a larger outlet. What can your church do to reduce the number of people who drift out through the back door or stamp their foot and walk through the very front door of our churches? Let's talk about the cause quickly. Let's identify where the losses are occurring. What's the cause? Out of Paul's farewell address in the book of Acts, Paul leaves with us some very food for thought ideas that we need to pay some attention to. And it's all of that that I want to share these particular points with you. The cause to determine, to identify rather, what is the reason as to why individuals are leaving? You may find that the majority of those leaving your church are part of a specific demographic. The question you and I must ask are, are you losing young families? Are we losing young families? Are we losing seniors? Senior adults? More female or more male? Are we losing families with teens? Are we losing young adults? Young professionals? Knowing where the loss is occurring will get you and I closer to understand why there is a loss in the first place. And knowing why will help you and I to create the right solution. classic icebreaker for me for years has always been a story of a father and a son having a conversation and the son said daddy what happens when somebody leave our church and become a member of another church what do you call that and the father said well son that is a backslider and an ungrateful one, I might add. And the son said, okay, 
So daddy, what do you call someone who leaves another church and become a member of our church? He said, well son, that's simple. That's a convert. <laughs> and one who now has vision. We need to be able to identify a particular demographic as to who it is that is actually living and get a better picture as to why they are living. Because remember, if we fail to address the needs of people, then we are going to lose people. Like my own mother, who expressed her desire that we weren't able to, to fulfill. The second is the concern. We could call it determining the issue. What is the real issue? If the issue has to do with the process, is the issue personal, as in people, or is the issue a perception? Something that somebody assume or believe with no real, no real um, truth to it. You know, when we understand the cause, it will get us to understand the why in the whole matter of the leaving scenario. Does your church have a process in place to keep track of people's involvement? We went to look for an engineer and Christian friend of ours to have conversation about a project and was blown away by what it is that he's doing within his community place in St. Catherine. And then, in our conversation, he point out something that had me thinking, or had us thinking, Sarita and I. He said that he was visited by some persons who wanted to make financial donation to a community initiative like his. But they had some, some drawbacks because they have been pumping in money into institution and organization that can't even keep track of the people that they claim to be helping over the years. They can't say where any of those individuals are. And he said when the question was posed to him, the gentleman said, tell me, so do you know where are your students? Can you Tell me, tell the students by name where they're located and what they're doing. And he was able to provide about 35. And the man was blown away with that. Got on his phone and called and said, listen, we have a serious brother on us, sir, and you need to come spend some money right here. When you began to say, well, that one is at such a place right now, that one is at such a place, that one is, that one is, that one is. And they were like, whoa, you're keeping track. You, you have a mechanism in place that is pointing out the involvement of people. Some churches put a lot of effort into getting people in the front door but lack the process that helps them to decide to stay. If a specific demographic group is dwindling, it may be time to add personnel to deploy more aid or more volunteer or better personnel in those particular areas. One of the things that church suffers from is volunteerism with attitude. 
when you are paid, you have greater demand for uh, a sense of service and production. But when it's volunteer, and volunteers with attitude, me no feel like go help them this morning. Me tired too. Yes. It's important that we find the right mix, the right type of personnel to deal with uh, people within the walls of our churches and those that we intend to reach. Shine.